Welcome home. I'm Dr. Tama, a minister, licensed psychologist, and sacred artist. And this is Homecoming, a podcast to facilitate your journey home to yourself. While I will provide weekly inspiration and mental health tips, this podcast is not a substitute for therapy. I'm so excited you're on the journey. If you want to request specific topics or share your progress, email me at homecomingpodcast at gmail.com. Also, after you listen, be sure to like, subscribe, and share. Let's begin. Welcome home. This episode of the Homecoming Podcast is brought to you by Pepperdine University, the institution where I teach. Since 1971, Pepperdine Graduate School of Education and Psychology has had one mission, to strengthen professionals for lives of purpose, service, and leadership. Online psychology at Pepperdine is the latest evolution of that mission, with online master's programs designed for people who want to align their work to their life's calling. The online master's program are led by renowned faculty in the field, who are passionate about their life's work and their students. The online format combines live, online learning with hands-on clinical training in each student's own community. If you are considering a career in psychology, pursue your purpose at Online Psychology at Pepperdine. Visit www.pepperdinepurpose.com backslash homecoming to learn more. And I am so grateful that you all are here on today. And this, our second season, I started requesting for you to send in your poetry about your homecoming journey. And that email address is homecomingpodcast at gmail.com. And we do have a poem for today. And this poem is from EJ. EJ means journey. It seems all your life you have been traveling to everywhere and everyone except to you, EJ. I am proud of you, for you finally allowed yourself to take a route you have never been your whole life and journey to your own self. It's been a lot of things, a lot of fights, late nights, confusion and uncertainties, but I am grateful to you for allowing the tears to flow for speaking up in places where you once had no words or just kept quiet for peace to reign. I am proud of you for confronting all your fears. I am happy that you could finally look yourself in the mirror and accept that it is you who is staring back. I am happy that you are healing. I am thankful for growth. Looking back, you aren't where you used to be. And that is simply because you finally decided to stop traveling to places where you are unseen, unheard, and undermined. I am grateful that you can now see you and accept you in your own fullness. Focus gave birth to clarity. Looking back, this is the best journey you have ever taken. You are still on your way. I know one day you will make it home. Keep going, EJ. I am proud of how far you have come, and I am going to make sure I get you home. I am going to get us home because it is you and I against the whole universe. I know God is with us. EJ, thank you so much for this piece. It is so powerful and a reminder to us of the importance of looking back and noting, appreciating, celebrating our progress. You all, whether you have been with us for one episode or for over a year, it is a beautiful thing to be able to reflect on ourselves and to think about circumstances where you would have been silent and where you found your voice or where you would have remained, but in this season you have stepped away from to notice the internal and external 
changes are really such a beautiful part and it encourages us to keep going on this process to keep coming home to ourselves. So today, as we continue the journey home, we are going to focus on releasing warrior mode, letting go of defensive tendencies. Releasing warrior mode, letting go of defensive tendencies. And I want to appreciate for each of us that there have been times in our lives where we had to fight. And I remember a line out of The Color Purple, the book and the movie, where the character says, all my life I've had to fight. And I know that there are those who are listening who have had to defend themselves against their own family, those who have had to defend themselves against the realities of racism and sexism and all forms of oppression, that there are those who are listening who even had to defend themselves from so-called friends or fake friends, or some people say frenemies. Uh, and unfortunately, there are even those who are listening who had to defend themselves against the person or people who claim to love you. And so when you have had to live with, be in partnership with those who are trying to destroy you spiritually or physically or emotionally, it primes you to be on alert, to be vigilant, to be hyper vigilant, and to be ready whenever for whatever. And it is so important for us to, one, honor the ways in which we had to fight to survive and appreciate that those seasons of war mode may be a part of what helped us to get to where we are. But then we also recognize the painful reality that when I live in battle mode, I am not fully living that if I have to constantly be guarded and vigilant and self-contained and shut off and observing and monitoring and critiquing and at all times and in all places, that is exhausting. And so living in that place, while there were times in your life when it may have been necessary it is my hope for you, it is my hope for us that we would enter into a season where we don't have to live in that mode. That yes, there will be times when we have to rally ourselves or when we have to respond uh, to verbal or physical or psychological attacks, but it is so important to know that we deserve to have a place, to have places where we can put our armor down. That in order for me to come home to myself, I need to be able to breathe. For me to come home to myself, I need to be able to sleep. For me to come home to myself, I need to be able to let go, to release, to surrender to myself, in order to really come home to myself, I cannot spend 24 hours of my day observing you, trying to predict your next move, because the energy that I put into observing the environment and everybody in the environment the energy and time and effort that goes into all of that on a continuous basis takes me further and further away from myself. And so I can forget about me. I can neglect or erase me because I am so busy watching you. And so I invite you to consider 
not living in warrior mode. I invite you to consider what would it look like if you could have peace here, inner peace here? What would it look like for you to be able to have places where you can trust? What would it look like even within yourself for you to really be able to just be, to not have to strategize, organize, problematize, <laughs> to just be. And so as we consider that, I want to start with an awareness uh, of our own defensiveness, because some will read that title uh, or even hear the introduction and think, Ah, oh, this one may not be for me. I can skip it. And I want to encourage you not to skip it. That while there are uh, a range uh, of levels or dimensions to defensiveness, so you may have someone come to your mind who you feel is at a very extreme level of defensiveness. But if we really check in with ourselves I believe an awareness of it can really benefit us all. And so to consider that uh, that defensiveness really comes out of fear. And it can also come from experiences where you have been targeted or where you have observed other people being targeted. And the truth is there are people who are out to do harm. Right. There are people who don't have good intentions. Right. And so it is not then the solution to say, I'm just going to walk around free and open and trusting everyone with everything and uh, giving away all of myself. Right. At all times, in all places. But this is why it's important that we develop our discernment. Right. Where we develop our capacity to trust uh, the still small voice within. And I know for those, especially those of us who are trauma survivors, it can be hard to trust that or to know, is it my panic that is a result of my past or is there a real issue in the present? Let me ask it again. When I have survived betrayal, violation, trauma, I have to ask myself when an alarm is going off in me, is this panic a response to my past or is there something in this present moment that is problematic, that is dangerous, uh, that is unsafe and my body is trying to let me know to be on alert? Yes. So one of the ways we can think about that is when I have discernment, the alarm is not going off all the time, right? In other words, uh, I am a trauma survivor, also survivor of so uh, or interpersonal trauma. There's also the traumas of oppression, thinking about racism and sexism. Uh, and yet there are times in my day when I am at ease, right? There are encounters that I have with people and in those encounters, I am at ease. So then I have something to measure it against if I am in a circumstance and I am feeling triggered or unsafe, right? And I know this is not my norm. I don't have this response to everyone at all times. Right? So this has been important information for me to take in, yes? As opposed to when uh, we are really uh, in that place of defensiveness, uh, we are perpetually expecting doom. And I want to just start with compassion for those who find themselves in that place because usually it's because bad things have happened, right? Like that racism is real. Sexual assault does happen. Uh, child abuse has been a reality for some who are listening. 
uh, community violence, school shootings, gang violence. These are all realities. And so uh, if you live in that place of uh, warfare internally, it is often because you have experienced warfare externally. Yes. So I want you to hear me clearly in uh, understanding that and then saying, what are uh, the external things that I can do and what are the internal things that I can do? And so what I mean by that in terms of the external or the situational is if I have so-called friends or dating partners who are continuously uh, mistreating me, undermining me, demeaning me, then it's not so much I need to just stop being defensive. It may be that I need a new friendship circle. Yes. So that is an external reality that is causing me to live in that place. Right. Uh, when someone is experiencing sexual harassment on their job and every time they come into the workplace, there are comments being made about uh, their body or they're being pressured uh, in sexual ways, then it is understandable and probably wise that when you're in that workplace, you're feeling very vigilant and guarded. And then I need to think about what are some potential solutions here? Uh, is it possible for me to report it? Do I believe if I report it, something will be done? Is it to a place where I want to start looking for a position someplace else? You know, what are the things that I can do in my environment that will help me to not just feel more settled, but to actually be safer? Yes. And so we become aware of the, the realities that have created uh, the vigilance. And so you want to begin to reflect on yourself and think about, am I always on the lookout for mistreatment or disrespect? Is that how I spend my days? Is that when I'm having conversations with people, am I looking for the slight? Am I looking for the offense? Um, am I prepared for it? Have I entered the conversation in battle mode, right? Now, don't get me wrong. <laughs> there are going to be some conversations in your life that are a battle. But is that every conversation with every person every day? Right? If I am in that place, I am not truly at home within myself. And so we become aware of the perpetual search for slight or offense and when I engage with people from that place of battle, and I'm sure you have experienced it if you're on the receiving end, you know, if someone starts a conversation and you can tell from the beginning of the conversation there is an issue, right? Even if they haven't named it, you're clear there's an issue, and then you get defensive back or you start uh, preparing yourself for what's coming because you know whatever's coming is not good, right? And so there are a way, there are ways in which we can participate uh, in these dynamics. And when we think about defensiveness, you also want to consider your level of trust, right? And your capacity to trust uh, that some people live from the standpoint of, I'm going to trust you until you give me a reason not to trust you. And some people live from the vantage point of, I'm not going to trust you until you prove yourself to be trustworthy. And then even if you operate from that standpoint, is has anyone ever proven themselves to be trustworthy? Right? You know, it's one thing to say, I'm slow to warm up to people, but you have relationships and friendships that have grown over time, right? So you would say, well, we didn't start off as besties, but we have develop this friendship or this relationship or this intimacy and now I can trust them versus if we say I wait for people to prove it and no one has ever proved it right then I want to start really examining that and examining my heart in that and then you want to consider around defensiveness if you are uh, quick to create stories that uh, interpret people's behavior in the worst 
possible way. Right. So, you know, if someone I know uh, walks past me on the street. Right. So the worst possible thing it, it, scenario is I started imagining in my head, I can't believe they don't like me anymore. People are always rejecting me. They think they're better than me. They think I'm stupid. They think I'm ugly. They think this. They think that. I can't believe it. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Right. I can go to this whole thing. And it may be possible they didn't see me. It's possible they have a lot on their minds. It's possible uh, that there is an issue that we need to discuss and they're not ready to have the conversation yet. There are a lot of possibilities. And so uh, for us to be mindful of is my immediate reaction to anticipate the worst. And this can again go with trauma, right? That some people who have experienced trauma, if a loved one is late coming home, then you're immediately picturing them on the side of the road dead, right? That if someone is late, it must mean either they don't love me or they're cheating on me or they died, right? And it turns out they were just an hour late because they got caught up in traffic or had to work late. Or, but So we want to consider how we read and interpret people's motives. And I want you to hear me clearly I'm not saying the aim is to be naive because there are people who are up to no good, right? That's what makes it challenging or difficult is to know that sometimes the interpretation um, of a negative motive is accurate, but it is not all the time, right? So what is my expectation or my anticipation at all times? And then a last sign, uh, that you may want to work on defensiveness is when we don't trust our own feelings or thoughts, but we act really strongly and boldly, even with our uncertainty, right? Because that's a part of what creates the explosiveness is I um, feel upset, distressed, insecure, fearful, unsafe, and I need to let you have it because Maybe if I explode, you will see me, you will hear me, you'll respect me, you will choose me, you will honor me if, if I explode, right? So then we have created uh, another dynamic where the belief is the only way uh, to be positively treated is to be a warrior, right? that I am going to demand it by my fierceness. And so we want to take this moment of being gentle with ourselves, being compassionate with ourselves, taking this moment to actually breathe and exhale as we consider a few strategies for these moments when we are feeling triggered or unsafe uh, or slighted. The first one is sacred pause. And I've used that phrase many times uh, in our season here together. And sacred pause is, it, uh, is taking a breather, taking a break, not being reactive, and the sacred part of it is I'm checking in with my spirit about what is it that I'm feeling, thinking, wanting, believing, knowing. And then I am also checking in to give myself compassion and to remind myself of my value, my worth, my wisdom, so that I can decide how I want to respond. And so when I take sacred pause, it is not just letting some seconds pass, but it is what I am doing with those seconds that I am thinking through. I am thinking through what is going on for me in the moment. And so with your sacred pause, you can relax your shoulders. 
you can take a breath. You may want to lower your gaze for a moment so you're not so focused out there, but you're checking in with you about, I believe this is what is happening. And so let me examine within myself what is coming up so that uh, I, I can move from being reactive to being thoughtful about my response. So as you take sacred pause, also helpful to take breath. Often when we are frightened, when we are uh, afraid, when we are outraged, we often stop breathing. And so now if I'm fearful and not breathing, who knows what's going to happen next, right? Often, often things that are not going to go well for me or for the people around me. And so we want to take breath and really give that to myself because especially when someone has taken you by surprise uh, or comment or behavior has taken you by surprise, often we can go into a panic, right? And so really allowing myself to breathe, which can also help to de-escalate the circumstance. And then I want to acknowledge what I'm feeling, right? Because often our surface response or our immediate response may be uh, the anger, um, but then also to say, in addition to the anger, perhaps what is under there? You know, am I feeling threatened? Am I feeling fearful? Am I feeling uh, intimidated? Am I feeling uh, insecure? Am I feeling despair? Hopelessness? Right? Checking in. What, what do I feel in terms of what has happened? And then I am looking for truth because uh, in psychology, we talk about uh, cognitive distortions, right? So sometimes we are walking around with some untruths and, and my whole behavior, my life can be guided by a lie. Right. So if I'm walking around with the untruth um, that no one will ever care about me. Right. If that's the core thought, if that's my core belief, no one will ever care. Then sometimes when people do care, I get defensive and can't really believe it and can't really trust it. Or when people show that they don't care, uh, then I adjust myself to the lie because I don't believe I am worthy of care. Yes? So I want to start to slow down and think of what do I know for sure in this moment? All right? So the part about walking down the street. I know for sure that I know that person, and that is who I think it is. And some of you may even say, I know they saw me. That may or may not be accurate, but um, I know for sure I know them, and they walked past without speaking. Right. That's what I know. Well, one of the interesting things in this story is that you didn't speak either. <laughs> right. We often miss we can miss our part in the story because they may be halfway down the block also thinking such and such just saw me and didn't speak. So I want to start reviewing for myself. You know what? What do I know? Right. What do I know? is true in this moment. And so based on taking pause, breathing, checking in on how I feel, reviewing in my mind what I know, then I can determine how I want to respond. And the last piece I will say about this is to be aware there are a range of responses that are available to you. There are a range of responses that are available to you because often when we are in that defensive place, we feel I have no choice. I have no choice but to cuss them out. I have no choice but to yell. I have no choice but to storm off. I have no choice but to throw something. I have no choice but to tell them how little I think of them. I have, you know, so we can get in this piece where 
Uh, we'll even say to ourselves, you know, I didn't have a choice because they disrespected me. So I had to do that. And so for us to, in our sacred pause, to consider what are my options? And uh, here's the part for us to also be mindful of is if I am getting defensive and the person I'm interacting with, I am in some sustained relationship with, like a family member, a friend, a dating partner, a spouse, your children, uh, people at work, that you do not have to solve it in that moment, right? That is a part of what uh, can really uh, make things explosive is the feeling of, I have to respond now and I don't have time to think about it, right? And of course, there are times in our lives where we have to make quick decisions, but that's not all the time. And so I bring that up because some of you, as you hear me talk about sacred pause and those different steps, you may say, I don't have time to do all that, <laughs> right? And if it's a stranger on the street, right, then I don't have a lot of time. If it is someone who lives in this house with me, then I may want to take some time to reflect to decide, to think it through, to give myself breath and to remind myself of my value and my worth, right? And so giving ourselves sacred pause, whether it is for a few minutes or longer, can help us to center in and be mindful of our responding over reacting. So I want to appreciate you on today hanging in for this journey. And my hope is that you did not just think about other people who need to hear this episode. Right? Some people will hear this and they'll say, oh, I need to send this to such and such. Well, I wonder if you can also think about this me. Like there are moments in my life when I have been reactive. There are moments in my life when I assume the worst. Or there have been seasons in my life, which may even be now, when I have lived in warrior mode. When I have been on the battle at all times with all people. And I give myself permission, even if it is just for this moment to lay down my armor, and to breathe. I invite your soul to tell your heart, mind, body, and spirit, welcome home.